Welcome to everyone who is joining us for our webinar, the Residential Site Improvement Standards uh, versus Stormwater Management. Um, it's a little bit early, but I wanted to welcome everyone and we'll be getting started in a couple minutes. If you have questions, there is a question and answer bar usually on the bottom of your screen. Uh, please put your questions in. Uh, for those people who are attorneys, uh, we have not yet submitted to become uh, uh, approved for continuing legal education credits, but I'm looking to do that. Uh, so if you're an attorney or an interesting in CLE credits, um, please make sure you stay on. I will have a poll a couple times during this to so you can register your continued attendance. Um, and then once we're finished, I will collect that information and let everyone know when we do submit uh, and what those results are. So I'll give it a couple more minutes uh, as people starting to join in. And so yeah, there was a question in the chat already. Uh, yes, we are recording this and we will um, post it uh, to our website later on and we'll set a link out to everyone who has registered, uh, even those who can attend. So that. All right. So we have a good number of the registrants uh, have already joined. Uh, so again, thank you very much for joining us. My name is Mike Pissarro. I'm the policy director for the Watershed Institute, and we are here for residential site improvement standards versus stormwater management. This is a program co-sponsored with the Association of uh, New Jersey Environmental Commissions. Uh, I appreciate their support in this. Um, so just a quick, the Watershed Institute, if you're not familiar, we're a nonprofit watershed organization. And our mission is keeping water clean, safe, and healthy is the heart of our mission. Um, we do all, all of our work through uh, advocacy, conservation, science, and education. Um, we have a uh, LEED certified platinum building in uh, Hopewell Township, New Jersey. Also, I wanted to point out, we have a couple programs related to green infrastructure, uh, a certification course, as well as a training course for maintenance. Uh, so that's coming up and there's that, and you can go to our website for more information. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are looking, and I have not yet submitted to get this course approved for continuing legal education credits, but if you are an attorney or interested, uh, please respond to the polls when I post them. Uh, and I will let you know as we go through that process. Uh, but to be clear, we have not gotten approval yet and have not actually submitted anything. Uh, so with that, uh, again, if you have question and answers, we're gonna do most of the question and answers at the end, uh, but I will be looking at them and uh, poking myself in when necessary to clarify something that has come up with our presenters. And I'm gonna turn this over now to Jennifer Coffey, who's the executive director of ANJAC for a few uh, introductory slides.
It helps when I unmute myself. Thank you so much for having us here today, Mike. We appreciate it. And thank you all for spending the evening speaking about stormwater ordinances. Just want to say a few remarks about ANJAC and who we are, the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissioners. And uh, we, help, uh, we help local government as well as state government make good decisions about the environment. And we do that primarily by working with environmental commissioners who are volunteer municipal officials that support their planning boards, zoning boards, as well as elected officials. We offer some signature programming in the spring. We have our fundamentals for effective environmental commissioners or what I affectionately call EC boot camp. that will be all virtual this year. So stay tuned, the dates will be announced for late February and throughout March. We also hold an environmental Congress every year. We had our 47th annual and very first virtual Congress this year. So if you happen to miss that, we had some wonderful sessions on um, clean energy, climate change, flooding, stormwater management, plastic pollution and more. And those are on our YouTube page and Jack View. So you can go back and watch those videos if you're interested. We also do a lot of work in partnership with the Watershed Institute and many, many other organizations in Trenton and throughout the state. And for those of you who haven't heard, we're very proud of the success this year that um, we achieved in partnership with environmental commissions throughout the state. New Jersey now has the strongest plastic pollution reduction law in the country, and I'm not tired of talking about it yet. So um, stay tuned for lots of programming next year. That law goes into effect in May of 2022. So we'll have lots of programming coming up next year. And that work was really a culmination of environmental commissions throughout the state who work to adopt 130 local ordinances on single use plastic in just a two year short time frame. We do a lot of work on green infrastructure, which we're going to talk about institutionalizing from a policy perspective this evening. Um, as we all know, municipalities must have an effective ordinance for stormwater management as of May 2nd, that includes the new provisions requiring green infrastructure. And so we have been working throughout the state to implement demonstration projects at libraries, municipal buildings, schools, parks, to show what green infrastructure can do. Um, this is a project we recently completed in Phillipsburg and that's our policy specialist, Alex Ambrose, uh, as the masked woman in the photo. And Jack also has a small grants program where we provide resources to ECs to build community gardens, do trail maintenance, rain gardens, et cetera. Um, a shout out to the environmental commissioners there uh, on tonight. You guys have done a phenomenal job with constructing green infrastructure, keeping your ordinances strong, and really went above and beyond. Um, this lower right photo is a, a community food drive that one of our ECs conducted to uh, reach out and support the members of your community. ANJAC also works in coalitions throughout the state with um, thousands of active nonprofits in the Garden State. We know that we need to pool our resources, one, to get your attention, and two, because there's not enough money to go around. So um, we're proud to work in different regions and different coalitions. So this is a, a snapshot of some of the work we do for clean water, um, electric vehicles, reducing flooding, et cetera. So this is how you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And this is what we look like these days, working from home with our kitties, our puppies, and our laptops. So we're fully functional and here to service uh, municipalities, however you need us in protecting and restoring your local environment. So thank you, Mike, for, for having us here tonight. Now you're muted, so it's hard to hear you. Still muted, Mike. I'm going to mute myself and I uh, move the slide. All right, thank you, Jen. Uh, so we have two great speakers tonight, Lisa and Maddox from Mason Griffin and Pearson, who uh, advises municipalities on developing ordinances to comply with the stormwater ordinance uh, and to address residential site improvement standard issues. And uh, Michael Sinkovich, who is a shareholder at Lieberman, Blecker, and Sinkovich, uh, who's representing uh, the Woodshed Institute, ANJAC, New Jersey Future, and Sustainable Jersey in a lawsuit as amicus um, regarding a, a, uh, an appeal of Haddonfield's uh, stormwater ordinance. Uh, so I just want to talk very briefly as why all of this is important. 
Oh, and I also want to provide the agenda. So we have the agenda so you can see sort of where we're laying out. Like I said, questions are at the end. Um, so why is this important? As Jen mentioned, uh, DEP adopted and published its new green infrastructure rules, giving municipalities one year to adopt a new green infrastructure rule. Um, so as municipalities are adopting it, you know, we've been asking municipalities to really look at the issues. Um, and there's multiple issues. So this slide really looks at 10 year, uh, six years worth of water pollution uh, monitoring DEP every two years as part of the Clean Water Act. Uh, issues a report that looks at whether the waters that they monitor are meeting the standards, the designated uses. And as you can see uh, from 2016 and 2010, there's a lot of red, which means those waters that DEP is monitoring are not meeting standards. And what DEP said in the 2016 report is our worst waters are getting better since they've started the program, uh, which makes sense, you know, as we've uh, address, addressed industrial discharges, waters have gotten cleaner. But our cleanest waters are getting worse. And the question is, why is that? Um, and mostly it's because of the way we handle our land use, our stormwater management. Again, here's another slide from that report, the Integrated Water Quality Assessment Report, uh, that there is a declining water quality trend. And they also indicated again in that same report that this trend is really a correlation between land use and our stormwater management. As our impervious surfaces, as our development increases, water impacts uh, are going to increase. So that's why it's very important that when municipalities are starting to address this new ordinance, that they do it and do it in a way that really goes above and beyond that state minimum and does provide benefits. And right in the model ordinance with DEP issued uh, with the new regulations, uh, it's a lot of language, but you know what DEP said is municipalities may want as part of their MS4 program to include optional measures uh, that are stronger or additional to those that the DEP um, have in their model ordinance. So that's why it's very important that we can do this. And if you think about it, uh, the general conception that residential site improvement standards prevents municipalities from going stronger when municipalities, you know, have a large chunk of their town and their development being residential. Um, if you can only apply it to commercial uh, and industrial and office complexes and retail, does it really improve water quality? Are you really addressing the problems? Uh, or are you causing uh, you know, a change uh, between two different classes of users? Um, so water pollution doesn't really care from what source it comes from. Um, so it doesn't really make sense that these standards, the residential site improvement standards, are really a prohibition for municipalities protecting their residents and water quality. Uh, I didn't put up slides, but you know, as we all know, as climate change DEP's reports are showing, we have an increased amount of rain, annual rain. Uh, we're getting that in stronger storms, more uh, intense downpours, uh, and just more of it each year. Uh, so flooding has increased. So you have water pollution issues, you have flooding issues, we need to address it. And that's why this topic is so important. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Michael uh, to talk through um, the conflict or the perceived conflict and why it really isn't. So off to you, Mike. Thank you so much. Let me hopefully get this up and running. Okay. Uh, Mike, thank you so much. And thanks for having me um, as part of inviting me to be part of this discussion. And uh, it's always interesting uh, speaking or, or hearing from, you know, the Watershed Institute and ANJAC um, and all of both the great work that they do and a lot of the insight uh, that someone like me who's a sort of practicing litigator doesn't necessarily get to see every single day. Um, and it's something that I really love. Uh, 
I have a background in environmental um, engineering. So uh, speaking about some of these more technical issues and hearing about them is always very interesting to me. So uh, with that, um, what I wanted to talk about today is a case that's going on now. Uh, it's on appeal and it's uh, regarding um, the, a, a uh, ordinance, a stormwater ordinance in Haddonfield uh, down in uh, Camden County. And uh, it deals with, as I'll get into in much more detail, um, the uh, residential developments, like Mike just said, and how, um, how or how not uh, can they be um, regulated by the municipality. So my overview, uh, really what I wanted to talk about is first and foremost, uh, I'm gonna talk about, um, well, first and foremost, we're gonna talk about the Haddonfield Ordinance. But before we get there, I just wanted to take a really large step back uh, and talk about the background of this program, why it matters, Mike already hit it. I'm gonna sort of talk about it even in more general terms. And then what the MS4 program is, uh, where it came from and why we have to deal with it. Uh, and then uh, go into you know the EPA and DEP's role in this process. Then again, as I mentioned, discuss the Haddonfield Ordinance and then talk about the specific case uh, and where we are and what our position is as interveners um, with the interplay between the RSIS and the stormwater management um, regulations. And uh, as I guess I already said, uh, this is an act of appeal. So everything that I am, you know, everything that I am saying is of course, uh, our belief and our position in the case um, and everything is in our brief. So there's no uh, secrets, trade secrets or any strategy here. This is everything we laid out in front of the court. So with that, I really wanted to just step back and start with why do we care about stormwater management? Um, Mike talked about it for a few minutes and you know, when somebody asks me this question, what I always say is, look, you gotta think about it just from a practical perspective. Rain, whether it's you know, runoff, whether it's actual precipitation, whether it's melted snow, whether it's things like that. Typically, if we didn't have any impervious surface, if we didn't have any buildings, what would happen? It would be absorbed into the soil. And you know, taking that to the very basic, what that means is that when water goes through the soil, soil acts as our sort of natural filtration in which you know, it takes a while to reach down to the groundwater. Some of the contaminants, some of the you know, turbidity, some of the total suspended solids, all these things hopefully get caught by the soil and before it hits you know, our aquifers where a lot of our drinking water comes from or before it hits groundwater and ultimately flows into open water bodies like rivers and streams. Uh, and what I have to the right there is, you know, a really basic uh, depiction of the global water cycle. And it really just shows, again, if you've taken any sort of basic hydrology class, you know, you know, these are generally the way things work. But the theory is, is that water is constantly moving from, you know, precipitation down to groundwater into water bodies, maybe into our drinking water, you know, and then back to, you know, transpiration that goes back into the clouds and so on and so forth. So to keep that water cycle is important. And that's, you know, in a very, very basic sense, that's one of the reasons why stormwater management matters. And of course, as I mentioned, impervious surfaces, such as pavement, such as roofs, they prevent groundwater from, or for rainwater or uh, snow melt or runoff from infiltrating into the ground. So why do we care? What's the problem? Runoff can be contaminated. Uh, it could have petroleum, it could have pesticides, salt, whatever other chemicals might be, you know, whether it be on your lawn, on your driveway, in roadways. Um, also, of course, and this was, you know, maybe the original reason for stormwater management, excessive runoff can cause flooding, can cause erosion, could cause property damage. And, you know, in really, really extreme circumstances, it could cause, you know, loss of life. So what's the solution? The basic solution is stormwater management. And what does that mean? That means we detain stormwater and try to remove pollutants. We want to permit infiltration and we want to restore that water cycle that I was just talking about. Uh, we want to also ensure that there's adequate protections to avoid those things. I was talking about the flooding, um, the dangerous conditions on roadways, the damage to homes and whatever other catastrophic things could happen if stormwater is really, really poorly dealt with. So 
what I wanted to do before we really just dive into the Haddonfield issue is take another step back and look at the federal and state laws that are at play here. Um, and this all begins with the Clean Water Act. Um, probably every single person that's on this, uh, on this uh, webinar has heard of the Clean Water Act. It's one of the uh, grandfathers or grandmothers of uh, environmental law in the country. And from a very basic perspective, what the Clean Water Act does is that it prohibits discharges of pollutants from a point source, and I'll explain what that is in a second, into the waters of the United States. Um, and uh, you can only do that, you can only then discharge a pollutant uh, if you have a permit. And it, again, the Clean Water Act could be a multi-day presentation. Uh, what the definition of waters of the United States could be a day-long presentation because as many of you probably know, that's a Supreme Court litigated issue all the time because the Clean Water Act doesn't have a definition of what the waters of the United States are. But suffice it to say, if you have a point source, which is you know some sort of concentrated um, conduit, like a pipe maybe, or um, you know what maybe an outflow from a factory, maybe uh, a outflow from a nuclear power plant, things like that. That's like a typical point source if you're thinking about, it. and you need what's called a NIPTES permit. And a NIPTES stands for National Pollution Discharge Elimination System Permit. The federal government and the federal scheme allows the EPA to delegate permitting authority to states if states want to do so. Uh, New Jersey is one of those states. And as you could probably have imagined, the permitting authority is the Department of Environmental Protection. And the permits that you get when you want to discharge a pollutant from a point source is what we all call an Egyptes permit. Important for this discussion also is that case law, federal case law has held and um, not been challenged that storm sewers are point sources subject to these permitting requirements. So why is any of this important? Um, if I try to move this forward, hold on. In 1999, uh, the EPA published its phase two stormwater um, regulation program rules for municipalities. It's an interesting time in environmental law because in 99 was in, in 2000 and the turn of the century was really an advancement from what I'd call sort of your basic environmental protections that we had in the 70s when the EPA started and uh, the 80s when we were concerned with things like Love Canal. Um, and really started branching out into what I'll call, I guess, broader areas like these municipal stormwater regulations. Uh, the NJDEP filed suit in 2004 and they started uh, with, with their final stormwater rules. And one of the things that came from that were general permits that municipalities needed to get for stormwater discharges called the MS4 permit, which is a term that if you never done this before, but if you kind of touch in this area, you've probably heard of the term MS4 permit. What it stands for is the Municipal Separate Storm Sewer Permit. Um, and um, among other requirements, what an MS4 permit requires is uh, for municipalities to adopt, amend, implement, and enforce a municipal stormwater control ordinance. So that sets the backdrop for where we are and how um, the basics for how a town or municipality like Haddonfield needed to adopt an ordinance. So what you need to do is every one of the municipalities in New Jersey needs to get an MS4 permit. MS4 permits have certain requirements. Um, an example of these requirements uh, for MS4 permits is here, which is presented on this screen. And what it is, is, is that's what a municipal stormwater ordinance has to at a minimum include. And a minimum is important because you have minimum and maximum being at play in a lot of what we're gonna talk about for the next 15 to 20 minutes. So as you can see, one of the things that needs to happen is um, Haddonfield or any municipality has to control aspects of residential developments and redevelopment projects um, that aren't preempted by RSIS, which we'll talk about in a moment. 
Um, there's also other controlling uh, mechanisms that need to be done, just like you know, for non-residential development, for redevelopment projects. Um, and the long and short of it is these MS4 permits require a pretty all-encompassing stormwater ordinance that is reviewed by the DEP um, and approved by the DEP, which also comes into play uh, in a few minutes. So the case study we're gonna talk about in Haddonfield uh, had a, their, per, their current ordinance was adopted in 2017 pursuant to their MS4 permit. As I mentioned a moment ago, it was reviewed and approved by the DEP. And the application of the stormwater ordinance, it really has four applications, which are number one, it deals with all site plans and subdivisions for non-residential developments that require site plan review. Um, it requires um, all site plans in subdivisions for residential developments that require site plan review and aren't preempted by RSIS. All projects undertaken by the municipality and importantly, and this is what it's issued here, all new homes and commercial buildings requiring a building permit issued by Haddonfield. So these four categories are what Haddonfield requires to have stormwater management before they can get whatever approval that they need. Essentially, if you look at these, I mean, you're really just talking about virtually every type of development in the town. And as Mike mentioned in his intro, Haddonfield, which is not, uh, unique um, in, the, in the state uh, is one of those towns where the vast, vast, vast majority of development that occurs um, is residential development. So, you know, residential buildings requiring permits, needing stormwater management, if you didn't have that requirement, the stormwater management in this borough would really um, not be overly broad um, and wouldn't really be overly protective. So I know there's a lot of words on this. I know this 100% violates uh, everything um, in the rule book for, uh, <laughs> for PowerPoint presentations, but this really right here is the pertinent part of the stormwater ordinance that's at issue in the case that we're dealing with. And that is, um, as I mentioned before, um, when you have, and, and really what I like to look at is, is D2 that's right here on the bottom of the screen. So site development stormwater plan approval. And I'm just gonna go through this slowly because we're gonna talk about it again in about five minutes. But an applicant site development project shall be reviewed as part of the subdivision application, a site plan review process, or a zoning permit application for the municipal board or official, by the municipal board or official from which municipal approval is sought. The municipal board or official shall, shall consult with with the engineer retained by the borough, the planning board or zoning board, if applicable or as appropriate, to determine if all the checklist requirements have been satisfied. So what you have here is it explains, the ordinance explains the all encompassing nature of stormwater management in Haddonfield in the different situations in which this stormwater management would be approved. So what you have here is the classic, I guess, competing interests or balancing of, you know, whether, you know, the costs outweigh the benefits or whether, you know, the require, you know, the requirements and the environmental protection are more important than development costs. And something that's well beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about today, but really does development really get that much more expensive if you simply just have to have some stormwater um, protection or stormwater management for a single family home. So that sets the backdrop for where we are. And what I wanted to talk about is what the laws that are in play um, when you have to do this analysis. So the first law that's in play, as I'm sure you all assumed I was gonna say, was, is the municipal land use law. Uh, the municipal land use law is adopted in 1975. And the purpose of it was, you know, there really needed to be you know, a guiding of appropriate use and development in New Jersey. I mean, New Jersey um, throughout its history has, you know, always, you know, was one of the first states that really started having significant suburban, I'll call it suburban sprawl, but a lot of development. I mean, right now it's one of the densely, it is the densely, the most densely populated state uh, in the country. 
And in the purpose of the MLUL at the very basics was to really guide this process. In 1981, the Stormwater Management Act was added to the MLUL, which is a little bit of a strange place, I guess, for it to be rather than be sort of out on its own, but that's where it started. And it required, even as far back as 1981, before these MS4 permits, it required municipalities to have stormwater management plans you had to conform to relevant state and federal statutes. statutes. But in the initial aspect of this in 1981, the real focus on uh, the MLULs, the, the Stormwater Management Act and stormwater management in general was reduction of flood damage. You know, we really weren't looking at this, this environmental harm that's the focus for, you know, the people on this panel and many of the people on this call um, and really the focus for the DEP now. We were really more concerned with flood damage. An important part of the MLUL within, you know, the Stormwater Management Act within the uh, MLUL, it states, uh, stormwater management ordinances shall be designed, and this is a quote, to minimize stormwater runoff from any new land development where such runoff will increase flood damage and to reduce soil erosion from any development or construction projects. So to make a long story short, in some, there was really no restrictions in the MLUL. Possibly, and this came up in the case, so it's worth discussing, is there is a restriction within the MLUL, which says a governing body can do whatever they want. I mean, they, they with a reason, they can have ordinances that require approval of subdivisions by the planning board, um, and you know that you need a resolution to get these approvals. However, the MLUL does have this uh, specific prohibition that says, detached one or two unit dwellings are exempt from site plan review and approval before planning board. Um, why does this matter? We're going to talk about it in a second, but but that's a really important part and really a, one of the big factors in the case that we're dealing with. The second law at issue, again, I don't throw a lot of words at you, is uh, the uh, residential site improvement standards or RSIS as we all call it. Um, and what the purpose of the RSIS was, was you know each town prior to when these were developed had different requirements, different standards. Everything was, you know, it was classic New Jersey with our, you know, in a home rule state, we had a lot of different things going on. RSIS's goal was to reduce the most multiplicity of standards for residential projects. Um, but it's important to note the goal is to eliminate unnecessary increases in costs and to reduce these multiplicities of standards where there are no, um, there are non commensurate gains in protection of public health or safety. So there is a little bit of a um, exemption within the RSIS itself. And again, I'll talk about that in a few seconds, but chapter seven of RSIS applies the DEP stormwater management requirements to these developments. Convoluted the way this regulatory scheme works, but this is how you get stormwater management into a lot of these projects, how it's required to be done in these residential projects. So where's the issue? Like, what are we talking about here? Obviously, stormwater management is required when you do certain um, development. So why are we concerned about whether you can regulate uh, residential de um, development, regulate stormwater in residential development. Issue number one is this. RSIS um, states that stormwater management measures are required for major developments. It also states that if you fall below a major development, um, you can control stormwater if the project for another reason is required is a subject of a subdivision application or site plan application. So essentially just keeping this as simple as possible, you effectively have to be a major development under RSIS for these stormwater regulations that are part of RSIS in chapter seven to apply. And what a major development is, is something that's disturbing one or more acres of land um, many homes are not disturbing one or more acres of land, um, single family or two unit dwellings. So that's issue number one. Issue number two is that RSIS specifically says 
to the maximum standards that may be required in connection with residential development. So now you have the situation where RSI says the maximum and RSI says stormwater applies to major developments. So what happens? In this case, um, a group, the Builders League of South Jersey um, filed a what's called an action in lieu of prerogative writ, which is for those that don't practice law is essentially an appeal of a municipal decision um, or a, you know, a ordinance or a planning board decision or a zoning board decision, something like that. Um, they filed an action in lieu of prerogative writ in the Superior Court in Camden County against Haddonfield. They filed it based on their stormwater ordinance amendment that regulated residential, you know, single family and two unit dwellings. And um, at the end of the day, for reasons that um, I'll explain in a second, the Superior Court ruled in favor of the Builders League. Um, they ruled in favor of the Builders League essentially for those two points that I just explained. Point one, the court said, okay, you're requiring these residential um, developments to be go before a planning board. And if you're not requiring them to go before a planning board, you're essentially doing that as a distinction without a, without a difference if they need to um, just get a uh, zoning permit or a building permit, which, which I believe respectfully is, is very incorrect. That is a very, very, very different uh, situation. But that was point number one, why the court found that um, Haddonfield couldn't regulate uh, one or two unit uh, dwellings. The second reason was what we just spoke about a second ago, which is that the court said major developments are the only thing under RSIS that can be regulated for stormwater, that stormwater can be regulated for. This, these one and two unit dwellings aren't major developments and therefore RSIS says you can't do it. RSIS is, you know, the, it's implementing statutes, the MLUL, therefore it's a violation of the MLUL and that's it. So um, what ended up, the, the matters on appeal now, Haddonfield filed an appeal uh, as Mike mentioned at the start of our discussion, we filed uh, to appear as an amicus party and we is uh, a group of four groups uh, of Watershed Institute, ANJAC, Sustainable Jersey and New Jersey Future. And uh, we were accepted into the case and the matter is fully briefed. And at this point we're waiting for an oral argument date. Uh, interestingly, um, for those that are attorneys um, may know this, but uh, the way appeals from what I understand the way appeals are dealt with uh, is the complexity of the issue gets assigned to different people within um, the courts, you know, within the appellate court system. So typically how these appeals work is you have uh, clerks or staff, you know, career staff attorneys review briefs, review the issues first, then either the clerk or the staff attorney reviews the issues with the judge before oral argument and then oral argument occurs and you get a decision. This process in New Jersey, New York's the same, takes a long time, takes at least a year generally, if not longer. Although it very, very much varies based on the difficulty of the case. Uh, for that reason, um, I think this is a pretty technical issue. And that may be why we still haven't uh, received an oral argument date, despite the fact that this has been uh, fully briefed since, uh, I can't even, I think it was 2019. If not, it was early this year, but I believe it was before the pandemic started. So so that's where we are with the case. And, and Mike, just, I'm gonna interrupt very quickly. Someone asked, yeah. could you repeat the first reason the court ruled in favor of the builders? Sure, um, and it's, it's actually right here. So what it is, the, the first reason is um, the uh, MLUL prohibits one or two dwelling unit buildings from site plan review and approval by a planning board. So what the court said was, in, in a, what the court essentially said was, they looked at the language of Haddonfield's ordinance, which is below, right at the bottom here. And they said, look, looking at this language, the court believed that what Haddonfield was requiring was that every single residential development would have to go before a board and get some sort of subdivision or site plan approval and uh, before planning board, you know, go through that whole process. And that's in violation of the MLUL. 
the reality of it is, is that we believe respectfully that the court misread the statement because really what Haddonfield is doing is, you know, if all you need is a zoning permit or a building permit, you'd go before a construction official like you typically would do under, you know, the Uniform Construction Code in New Jersey. And that construction official would look through a checklist to make sure you had all the requirements to get your building permit. And in this situation, one of those requirements would be stormwater management. So the court believed that that was a distinction without a difference, that going to a planning board or going before your construction official uh, is really the same thing. Um, for those of you that do this on a, you know, as part of either your practice, uh, you know that, you know, going before a planning board in which you have to provide public notice and have a public hearing and go through, you know, put, present witnesses is much different than just applying for a permit within the municipality. The second reason why, so for that reason, we don't believe that that requirement the, or that prohibition that one or two dwelling unit buildings are exempt from site plan review. We don't believe that really bears at all on Haddonfield's ordinance and therefore it should be valid. The second part is a little bit more complicated, but our position is RSIS, do, when, you, when you look at the totality of the language of RSIS, it does not prohibit stormwater management for residential developments that aren't major developments. There was a case, um, the League of Municipalities versus the DCA it was a 1998 case. And I believe, I haven't read it in a while, but I believe it was, you know, the case just like it happens with any major regulation that comes out, the case in which they were challenging the validity of the RSIS. Um, it's actually got a classic quote about uh, stormwater management because that was the RSIS, as you can imagine, since they still exist, were upheld as being valid. But there was a portion with regard to stormwater management that actually was discussed and overturned. And that was because, as we already spoke about, um, the RSIS are maximum standards for residential development. However, if you read the stormwater management rules that the DEP has, those are minimum standards that municipalities must follow. Plus, it says in the stormwater regulations, that the DEP is the entity that's supposed to be dealing with stormwater management. So uh, in the case, the DCA's position was effectively don't invalidate uh, the, the section I'm gonna show you in a second because we should just allow circumstances to take their course and it'll probably all work out. Uh, the court basically said, nice try. And their, uh, their specific quote was, good intentions do not always come to fruition. So what ended up happening is this is the section of um, the RSIS that was amended um, when, when this issue came up. And what ended up saying is, is that while these are maximum standards in the RSIS, they're, they're maximum except, and what I have underlined is the most important part, except as otherwise required by rules or other permit requirements of the DEP regarding stormwater management. So if you have your MS4 permit and in the MS4 permit scheme, you have the DEP reviewing your ordinance, you're required to, you know, whatever the DEP requires of you as part of that ordinance, like in our situation to deal with residential development because essentially the only thing that's really being built in Haddonfield is residential development that those requirements sh should not be um, a prohibition or the RSI shouldn't be a prohibition because you have the DEP, either the rules or the permits that are requiring us to do go beyond what are the quote unquote maximum standards, which would be a major development. When you look at that language, there's also other parts of the statute that really come into play here um, or parts of regulations that come into play. First, you have uh, the stormwater regulations uh, under the DEP that says, you know, these regulations are minimum standards and you shouldn't be construed as pre preventing anyone from having stronger standards. Um, number two, in the RSIS itself, as I talked about at the start of this, um, this discussion, you know, while the point of the RSIS was to reduce costs and reduce the multiplicity of standards, 
it's not supposed it's only supposed to do so when there's no purpose or gains for the protection of public health and safety. As we discussed at the start of this presentation, stormwater management's whole point is protection of public health, safety, and the environment. And therefore, really, the RSIS's just general statement is saying that, look, stormwater management shouldn't be something that is restricted because of RSIS. And then again, the overarching you know, policy of RSIS is, as I sort of mentioned before, it's the same idea is that, you know, we're really trying to ensure public health and safety. So going all the way back to the MLUL, the MLUL says specifically that a stormwater ordinance is required and it shall, it's required to minimize stormwater runoff from any new land development where such runoff will increase flood damage. So when you take all of these things together, really what you have is you have language that's confusing that hopefully the appellate division will clear up. But if you look at the totality of all of the regulations and all of the statutes, while the RSIS's purpose was to sort of streamline a lot of development, its purpose was not to restrict certain things that would improve public health and safety. And for that reason, and in particular with the case law I cited and the other sections of the RSIS to come into play, we feel that the RSIS doesn't at all in any way restrict a municipality's ability to, um, to regulate stormwater management uh, for uh, residential developments. So I know I just threw a lot at you. Um, if anyone has any questions after, let me know. If you wanna speak about this some other day, um, let me know as well. I'm happy to talk about it. It's hard to fit in in 30 minutes, but I wanted to give you a sort of broad overview or a, a quick overview of, of where we are with this. And um, with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop. I don't wanna take up too much time. I know Lisa has some really interesting things to talk about and uh, I'll be here for questions after. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, now, Lisa Maddox, uh, again, is an attorney with uh, Mason Griffin, and she's been advising uh, municipalities on developing their ordinance. So she's going to talk about that process and the ordinance. Uh, so go ahead, Lisa. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I have a um, some slides as well. So hopefully I can figure out how to share my screen. Um, let's see. Let me share my screen first and then let me know if this doesn't work. Nope, hold on a second. I'm a little challenged when it comes to this. I apologize. Let me try that again. <clears throat> All right, hold on, let me get this. Okay. Okay, does that work? Okay, hopefully you guys have uh, have the screen. Do, you don't see it yet? No, I mean, would you like me to run it? Hmm, wait, am I sharing my screen? You are not. I am not. Hmm, now am I sharing it? No. No. Share. Let's see if I can. There you go. Oh, you see, get to see one of my kids there. Okay. Oh, I did it. <laughs> Sorry. Hold on one sec. Okay. And there we go. There you go. Good. Okay. Sorry about that. That is not my forte. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much for including me in um, in this important discussion about stormwater management and. I've spent the past 20 years working with different municipalities um, as a municipal attorney, and I've worked with various environmental commissions and um, governing bodies and, and shade tree commissions on various environmental issues. So um, these, uh, these are really important. They mean a lot to me, these issues. Um, and I do spend a lot of time drafting um, ordinances. So um, that's, that's really what I'm here to discuss and to help, help you all with. Uh, what I specifically want to discuss are some alternative methods of regulating stormwater management at the local level, but specifically for 
one and two family um, properties that that we were that we were discussing, particularly because of the Haddon Field case. So what I <clears throat> the idea would be to pull the one and two family development from the the, the major development stormwater ordinance and um, deal with them with, with those issues separately. So these issues. Um, I'm sorry, these alternatives wouldn't rely on regulating through the site uh, plan ordinances like the, um, the, the ones uh, being dealt with under RSIS. Um, rather, I want to discuss the regulation of stormwater management through other means. The first being uh, the regulation of stormwater management under the uh, municipality zoning power, specifically under the MOUL. And then the second would be regulating under a municipality's general police powers. Um, I'm going to go through the legislative authority that I believe supports these uh, measures and present some ideas how to best draft ordinances to um, hopefully and successfully withstand any type of challenge that, um, that you may face. And I one thing I've learned through the years is that it's really important to plan out these ordinances, any ordinances, it's really important to plan out, but especially this type of an ordinance and taking it on a methodical step-by-step -step basis. Um, you want to make sure you have the statutory authority to enact the ordinance and you want to make sure you have the data and the facts to support what you're, what you're doing. And you want to make sure your selected methods, whatever they are and whatever your, <clears throat> excuse me, whatever your, um, your goal is that they're reasonable and they're ultimately rationally related to your ultimate goals. And again, this is true for any ordinance, but when you are dealing with potentially controversial, controversial issues such as these, you really want to make sure you insulate your ordinance as much as possible. Um, and you know, you're not going to have a perfect ordinance in, in um, any event. Um, and it doesn't mean that you'll necessarily prevail in the in the case of a a challenge, but um, your job as a municipal official or, or a municipal attorney is really to uh, make your ordinance as unattractive as possible for um, challenge and also make it as hard as possible for a judge to overturn your ordinance. So um, that being said, we're gonna move on to the first uh, type of an ordinance that I wanna discuss, which would be under the municipal zoning uh, authority. Um, and again, this is just a discussion of the regulation of one and two family um, development that's um, exempt from the RSIS standard specifically. So again, we want to pull that out of that main ordinance, your main stormwater ordinance, and deal with it specifically under zoning power. So the MLUL <clears throat> And several different, different functions and purposes. And, and one is to establish and define a municipality's authority to control subdivision and site plans. So again, we, we don't wanna deal with that right now for these purposes. We want to shift away from that and into a different realm, which is zoning specifically. Um, a municipality's zoning authority is uh, a distinct authority and it's, um, it's defined um, specifically under and NJSA 40 colon 55D 65. Um, but backing up a second, the um, a specific purpose of the MLUL is, is a general purpose and that's under section two. And it includes um, that um, the municipality is to encourage municipal action to guide the appropriate use or the development of all lands in the state in a manner which promote the public health, safety, morals, and general welfare. And there's no doubt that stormwater management at, in every instance um, is uh, a legitimate state interest. And, um, and it is a really important goal of uh, these land use ordinances and ordinances that may touch upon them as, as well in general. Um, and then moving on to more specific legislative um, authority, the MLUL defines what a zoning ordinance may contain. And specifically under, um, my quote here is being covered by the, the, uh, the link there for, are you listening? Sorry, the uh, NJSA 
40 colon 55D dash 65D specifically, and, and this is um, this is important for our purposes, but it um, allows municipalities to, astir, uh, to establish for particular uses or classes of uses these reasonable standards. And if you go down to the below, uh, to below of this um, of this subsection, it it also allows municipalities to deal with um, and impose these standards in connection with water, sewage, and drainage facilities. So this is a really important provision. And it, it, again, it allows a zoning ordinance to specifically address these subjects. So that's really the basis that I'm using for purposes of supporting um, a stormwater management ordinance that deals with one and two family properties in a zoning ordinance, in the, in the municipality zoning portion of its land use code specifically. So the next question is, um, is, is how do you go about doing this? Um, sorry about, let me go back. Okay, how do you go about doing this? <clears throat> like I said, I draft a lot of municipal ordinances and every time I draft one, I do think about what a zone, uh, an ordinance may contain, may not contain, and how to go about doing it. And I, and I really think about what the judicial standards are. And it's important to note that the case law that's out there, in the case law, the, the courts tell us how to draft these ordinances to best withstand challenge. So it's really important to look at the cases and, and, and look at what's out there to assist in developing an ordinance such as this. So um, again, the courts tell us how to do it. So I have some um, information here and some quotes from a, um, from a zoning case. And um, basically that, you know, the, these courts hold that um, there is a strong presumption um, that, that um, insulates zoning ordinances from challenges, but it's overcome by a presumption that um, an ordinance in its application in general or to a particular pro property is clearly arbitrary, capricious, or unreasonable, or contrary to the fundamental prin principles of zoning or the zoning statute. So um, basically your ordinance has to be reasonable and it has to be on um, a, a clear principle of zoning. Um, and as I mentioned before, I believe that municipalities do have a specific and um, clear statutory authority under the MLUL and specifically section 65D to regulate stormwater on one and two family properties through zoning. Um, and then uh, it's also important to note that again, courts aren't going to pass on the wisdom of these ordinances and, and, and they're not going to um, consider what the best method is. They're going to look and see whether there is a rational relationship between the means and the ends of the ordinance. Um, the, the means have to have a real and substantial link to the object sought to be attained. And they have to be reasonable and they can't over-regulate. So um, that being said, we're gonna move on to more specifics in terms of how I would go about drafting an ordinance like this under the zoning authority. Um, uh, what's the problem that we want to address? Um, just like in the case of major development, in the concept, context of one and two family development improvements, the problem is, is virtually the same. And you want to, um, the municipalities want to control flooding, um, increase uh, the groundwater recharge and reduce pol pollution. So um, that's your goal. Those are the problems that you want to address. Um, and it's really important to keep those in mind as, as you draft your ordinance. So once you identify your, your, your problem, the next step in drafting your ordinance is to identify the means to, to attain your goal. Um, and so what type of development will trigger your stormwater management uh, requirements for one and two family homes? Um, Again, crafting this type of an ordinance is more likely to withstand a challenge if uh, you're able to show and demonstrate that your standards are related to your ultimate goal. Um, and again, as a zoning measure, you have the basic goal of preventing flood, flooding and pollution and um, 
and improper drainage as a result of uh, improvements on property. So the next step is, so you look to how you're going to accomplish, uh, accomplish this in the, in the zoning context. Um, one idea, again, it's very similar to what's in the major development ordinance and um, it, it focuses on the size of the, um, the increase in impervious coverage on a piece of property. So it's an objective standard. It's a good place to start. And, um, and, and, and that's, it, it's a really good um, um, place to be for purposes of, of moving forward with your ordinance. So um, once you have that, you, um, you know, you want to be able to identify what kinds of development uh, will trigger the requirement. Is it any development on a, a residential property? No, of course not. It's, it's only development that increases the impervious coverage. Looking to the major ordinance, major development ordinance, um, you can kind of maybe look at that to see what how you wanna focus, maybe it's based on size. So maybe you look at, is it 100 new square feet of impervious coverage or is it 200 square feet of uh, new impervious coverage? So you wanna identify how much new impervious coverage will trigger the requirement of stormwater management. Um, again, it's an objective factor. Factor. It's used in other contexts, obviously. So it's, it's a good place to, um, to start with, um, with your standards. Um, then your ordinance has to, obviously, every ordinance has to define your requirements and your standards, your specific standards. Um, and I can't stress this enough, but you want to make sure your zoning and your engineering staff are on board and that they support this and that they have input because they are going to be heavily involved with this type of an ordinance. You want to obtain as much, many facts, data, and other information to support your requirements. Um, in one town, um, we're in the process of working on an ordinance, but a proposed standard is for every 200 square feet of new impervious coverage uh, by an improvement on one and two family properties that two gallons of stormwater must be managed on site. And then the ordinance will go into detail as to how that happens and what the review will be, but that's your basic standard um, under your zoning ordinance. So. Again, at all times, you have to make sure your goal, your 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 method of of attacking this problem is going to or is likely to resolve your issues and, and your problems. You have to make sure there's that connection at all times. Otherwise, um, it, you know you're you're susceptible to successful challenge um, against your ordinance. But you know you have a lot of different options. You can deal with different properties differently. You know, you may have really large lots in one area of your town and smaller lots, and you might want to deal with them differently and impose different standards. And that's okay under a zoning ordinance because the zoning ordinances can make those distinctions. So it's really important to identify all your different problems and set them in, into your ordinance and make them as specific as possible. So it, it's going to be a, a case by case and, and municipality by municipality decision, but the main purpose and what I want to convey is that there is, even if you, you don't want to deal with <clears throat> one and two family properties under your major development ordinance because you're concerned about these potential RSI, at RSIS issues that Michael was, was discussing, there is another path to regulating stormwater management on one and two family uh, properties through specifically your zoning ordinance. Um, so, like I said, that's, that's, I, 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 I like that method of dealing with this issue uh, a lot. And um, I, I think it's, it's a solid approach for municipalities. But there may be some municipalities that aren't comfortable dealing with stormwater uh, management on one and two family properties through the MOU at all, because they're concerned, like in the Haddonfield case, they're just worried that that it might not be allowed. And I'm not passing judgment on that case, but there may be some concern. So <clears throat> another type of an ordinance that you might wanna consider is um, adopting stormwater management on your one and two family properties through um, your general police powers, which every municipality um, is entitled 
to, to use. Um, so that's NJSA 40 colon 48-2. And this is the statute that enables a municipality to adopt ordinances under police powers. And it provides um, that a municipality may make and enforce ordinances not contrary to the laws of the state or of the United States, as it may deem necessary and proper for the government, order and protection of the persons and property and the preservation of the public health, safety, and welfare, the municipality and its inhabitants. It's extremely useful. Um, it's one of my favorite statutes. I use it all the time. And what I'm proposing is that this could be used for a municipality to address stormwater management on one and two family properties in slightly different context. So you're not looking at it from a land use perspective, you're looking at it purely from an environmental perspective. Um, I, I think it is a viable option and I haven't actually drafted an ordinance under this section, but I've, I've talked to a couple of other attorneys and it's definitely out there as being um, a, a feasible um, method of handling <clears throat> and addressing this problem without even going near the MOUL. Um, I, there is a case that I, another, a case that I really, um, I rely on a lot for a host of different reasons, but um, this case is useful in this context. It's New Jersey Shore Builders Association versus the Township of Jackson. Um, and this case supports that in, in, in some circumstances, certain municipal pro problems can be regulated either as land use regulation or through a municipality's police powers. Um, in this case, the township adopted an ordinance regulating the removal of trees on private property. And the ordinance required a property owner to replace tree, any tree that's removed. And if that's not feasible, they would have to pay into a municipal fund dedicated to the planting of trees on public property. Um, the Builders Association in that case, the plaintiff, argued that the ordinance was actually governed by and violated the MLUL. Um, it also argued that the ordinance um, regulated the use of land and therefore was it, was, it fell under the MOUL. And the court didn't agree in that case. Um, the court found that the municipality clearly stated that it was adopting it under its police powers and that was sufficient for the, the court. The court stated that the, the town and so the court recognized this, that the town specifically declared that it was enacting this ordinance under its police powers. Um, it didn't adopt it pursuant to the MLUL. And, um, and in this instance, it wasn't a planning or a zoning initiative under the MLUL. It was a generic environmental regulation. Um, they, the court found that it was a valid exercise of the municipality's police powers. Um, and that the means selected were rationally related to the, um, the problems that the municipality was trying to resolve. Uh, the court recognized that the ordinance was intended to ameliorate the evils of tree cutting um, on particular pieces of property, as well as to serve general environmental goals, including the maintenance of the biomass of the municipality and to protect the tree canopy and oxygen production. So this, case is extremely important in, in, in this context and in a lot of other contexts, but in this context, context specifically, because I think it does help support the use of general police powers under NJSA 48-2 to regulate stormwater on one and two family properties without going into the MLUL and just dealing with it under municipalities police powers. <clears throat> so, um, How do you go about doing this? So basically you are going to um, create your ordinance in this instance, if you're going to do it this way, to focus on the environmental issues um, involved that are created when there's an increase in impervious coverage. Um, you um, are not gonna focus on the specific land use elements, but you're gonna look at the environmental, the broader environmental concerns. And again, under the police powers, this is not a land use measure. It is not an MLUL measure. 
It protects property, protects the community, uh, your neighbor, the neighboring properties, and it protects the environment in general from the dangers uh, created by um, overdevelopment. Um, so again, you know, you're gonna draft it similarly to you would in the zoning context, but again, your focus isn't land use. So you're going to make sure your, um, your, um, your ends and means match and that they're rationally related, that you are not overbroad, that um, you don't overregulate, that you're touching up upon the, the, the actual activity that you're really concerned about. Um, and, uh, and again, you wanna focus on the environmental problems and environmental concerns rather than the, um, the goals and intent of the land use ordinance. Um, and there may be a benefit to handling the, the issues of stormwater through a police powers ordinance. Um, but the uh, one concern that, um, that you may want to think about is that you won't have available um, the appeal to a zoning board where you would have that if this were a zoning ordinance, you'd have the appeal to a zoning board, you won't have that here, um, the ordinance is going to have to set forth all the requirements and there won't be an appeal. So it has to be a little more finite in its description. So just, just throwing that out there. But um, there's something to think about when, when you're selecting the, the method that you want to attack this problem. Um, so there are lots of different ways of dealing with it. And some of these are a little creative, but I mean, I, I really firmly believe that these um, these different statutes do provide statutory authority to get you to where you want to be. Um, and it might be just, you know, you might be um, kind of skirting the issue of the MLUL and specifically RSIS, but um, that's okay because there are different statutes that allow municipalities to do different things. And so all we're doing is using those different statutes for um, a similar purpose. Um, so that's that's all I have right now. If anyone has any questions, they uh, again, I I guess I throw a lot of um, somewhat mundane information at at, at some of you. But um, uh, let's see. I'm gonna get rid of my screen here, and uh, hopefully, I can figure out how to do that. How do you? I don't have any further um, slides. So just trying to see here. If you go up towards the <laughs> your screen, you should Oh yeah, have right the, in the middle. There you yep. go. Did that work? Nope, not yet. You gotta click on okay. it. I'm gonna take what? over anyway. It just doesn't like me, thank you. I don't know why I, I kept pressing and it didn't really like me, I apologize. All right, Lisa and Mike, uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to put up this and then I'll uh, take some, you know, go through the questions. There are a lot of good questions. Um, and I have to move my Q&A. So there's two things I've always liked to point out in the stormwater ordinance or the stormwater regulations. Uh, in the stormwater regulations, it says, nothing this chapter should be construed as preventing the department or other agency or entities from imposing additional more stringent stormwater management requirements necessary to implement the purpose of any enabling legislation, including those measures necessary to achieve water quality standards. So that's right there in the stormwater management regs. And also in the surface water quality standards, you know, another DEP reg is Agencies shouldn't be approving things that are going to cause irreversible changes to existing water quality or that would impair or preclude attainment of the designated uses. So as, as everyone remembers, you know, a lot of New Jersey's waters, it's something like 95, 99% of New Jersey's waters that we've monitored do not meet one or more of the standards that we set out for it. So that really, really sets forth why this is so important. Um, but so with, the, I just wanted to point that out that's there uh, as an additional point and you know, the stormwater management, the Clean Water Act, 
the surface water quality standards are all water pollution control, which is New Jersey's version of the you know, Clean Water Act uh, requirements. So with that, uh, we do have a bunch of questions. Um, Lisa and Mike, if you can sort of bring yourself back up. Um, I think the first question, uh, I will just go, I think the first question was, and I just want to clarify, uh, Mike, the Haddonfield case, which is up before appeal, uh, doesn't have an oral argument yet. So that, that case is still pending? Correct. All right, so that was one question. Um, Here's a question regarding the police powers. The stormwater management benefits frequently do not accrue to the local municipality or its citizens, but only to downstream municipalities. Uh, so yes, that's somewhat true, but um, I think it also applies within the municipality and to downstream neighbors, uh, and in some ways can actually benefit upstream neighbors. I don't know, Lisa, if you had any inputs for that? Not really. Um... No, no I, don't, I don't really have any anything to add. I, I, I'm not sure if I entirely understand the question, um, but yeah, I don't see that as restricting the ability to to regulate, you know, the, the basic issues on on a piece of property. So I, I think in the person who put that in, and they want to clarify, please do. But I think the point is, even though there would be benefits outside of the municipality oh, I'm sorry. doesn't necessarily prohibit the police powers, the municipality. Oh, I, I apologize. A absolutely. And that's, you know, that's, that's one of the issues that was raised in, um, in that, that Jackson case that the benefits of protecting trees are, it's just so much bigger than just the municipality and the inhabitants of that one town and even those, those properties. So, when you're considering these environmental issues, even from a police power standpoint, um, the greater environmental benefits are just, um, it, it's, 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 it's an added benefit in, in terms of, of the ordinance itself. So um, that's why using the police powers for environmental issues is, is so beneficial because you're not restricted just because it may benefit others outside of your municipality. <clears throat> Excuse me. Great. Um, so another question, uh, regarding RSIS, so seven colon 21 dash 7.1, uh, allows control of runoff rates and routing from minor developments. Can control be liber liberally interpreted as quality and recharge as well? Does RSIS limit control in minor subdivisions to natural means? Um, None of you want to take a stab at that, Mike? I, that's a great question. I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, so, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, you please, please. So uh, I've looked into this a little bit and the, the Watershed Institute had developed a model ordinance that for minor developments, uh, the trigger of uh, 250 square feet, you control two gallons per square foot mm -hmm. uh, through green infrastructure. So that wasn't the quality, quantity, and recharge requirements you necessarily see in a major development. Um, so it, you're going to get quality benefits and you're gonna get recharge by definition if you run that through green infrastructure. Um, but that's sort of what we did. RSIS doesn't limit control to natural means necessarily. The new green infrastructure rule by DEP does itself. Uh, and I would argue you know, your minor development requirements, your municipality does that should mimic those green infrastructure. You shouldn't go around those requirements uh, when you do a minor development or reduce your major development thresholds. Um, Here's a question. Do building codes need to mo be modified if we strengthen the stormwater management regs, raise small residential development? I, I don't think that's the answer. I don't think you have to. I think it's, uh, you know, at least as you mentioned, it's either site plan, it's police powers, it's zoning. Yeah, I think 
building, especially if it's if you're under the uniform construction code, I would I don't think your construction official really has authority on on these types of issues because it's not really covered under the UCC. All right. So All right. yeah, I would stay away from it in that context as much as possible. <laughs> All right, uh, another question. Does using police powers work against acceptance of ordinance and incite negative overreach by government, non-acceptance of intent and goals? Question. Um, you have to be careful. I think anytime, you know, you have to make sure you have, that you don't overreach um, and that you have to be really careful because those are the kinds of arguments that, are, that will be made um, in any kind of a challenge. So that's where, you know, you have to really sharpen that pencil to make sure your ordinance is crafted in such a way that it's really specific and it's really targeted. So. And I will say the Watershed Institute has been going around and meeting with municipalities talking about the need for stormwater management. And I think it, when you roll a, a, an ordinance out, if there is a public education component, either during the introduction, during mm -hmm. the adoption, or even afterwards, really explaining to the residents, to the citizens, why the municipality went stronger, what the issues they were trying to combat. Mm -hmm. uh, by and large, I think people of New Jersey really understand the flooding issues. We've all sort of right. started to experience more and more uh, problems getting to work um, because of flooding, uh, roads are being closed. You know, our property is being flooded out and, you know, being uh, you know, a sopping mess for several days. Um, that if you really do that education component, you sort of get at uh, and address the complaint about a government overreach. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get rid of it all, but I think that's always helpful. Um, so... I think this one is Lisa. Um, if the ordinance is created under the police powers, are they required to enforce or can another agency or official be the enforcement officer? Right, so the police are not going to enforce. It would be, I would suggest that it's your, in, your engineer, um, the engineering office. I wouldn't involve the zoning official because then you know, you're crossing the line a little bit um, or a lot into the MLUL, but um, I, I think this is an area where, or, or you can have a dedicated stormwater um, management coordinator that works with the engineer's office, but someone who is well-versed and uh, very knowledgeable and able to um, address the issues that are going to come up. So yeah, I would, I would say you're an engineering department. All right. Lisa, another question, one and a little more clarification between sure. the differences between a, a MLUL ordinance and one under the police powers. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of the general question. Um, so, well, your statutory authority is different. You have the MLUL would be under, uh, you, you would be, um, it would be a zoning ordinance. So it would be put under your zoning ordinances and um, you would link it to your residential property. And maybe it'll, it only, would only be on certain properties, um, types of properties based on, on the size. Um, your police ordinance really needs to, it has to be in your you know, general ordinances and it has to focus not on the land use. Um, it really needs to focus on your, the environmental issues that result from um, more small scale development. On, on single and uh, two family properties. So it's your patios and your pools and things like that, that are likely to trigger the requirement. Um, they could be very similar. Um, the actual content of the two ordinances could be relatively similar, but you have to make sure you focus and, and you always have in, in your mind um, what can be in a zoning ordinance which may be a little bit more specific and a little bit more stringent. Whereas in your general police powers, it may have to be, um, may not, you might not be able to be as stringent just because you, you have some more limitations, um, you, you know, because it's not a zoning ordinance. You, you can't, you might not be able to limit it uh, from zone to zone, uh, different residential zones. It might just have to be a general ordinance that applies across the board. And you may have some exemptions, for instance, if it's a major development. So you, you, know, you wouldn't apply twice. You wouldn't have the stormwater management uh, rules apply twice or 
requirements apply twice, but um, so your focus will be a little different as well. So yeah, they, they could be similar in some ways, but you really have to focus on the enabling legislation, which allows you to enact the different ordinances and yeah, and, and look to some of the, I mean, again, this is it's somewhat academic, but you have to look maybe to, you know, have your attorney look at the uh, case law that governs these types of ordinances in the different instances to make sure you're, um, you're on firm ground with, with either one, because it, it is a very uh, potentially controversial issue in, in some municipalities. <laughs> All right. There is a handful of questions that are more focused towards our model ordinance mm. uh, and those requirements. Um, I can address those when I give mm -hmm. the opportunity uh, for RSIS questions or zoning police power questions. And then, um, so give that another minute or so and see if there's anything. Um, so the, just one question. Uh, as I mentioned, something like 95% of all of our studied streams aren't meeting one of the more standards. <clears throat> DEP is part of the Clean Water Act, issues a report every two years. It missed a couple of years, uh, but that's the, I always call it the 303D list, which is where it's under the Clean Water Act, but it's the New Jersey's water qual integrated water quality monitoring report. The most recent is 2016. Uh, that's where that's numbers came from. Uh, I put in the chat box uh, earlier where you can find those reports. They've been doing those, I think go back to 2004. Um, so you can look at that. Um, and I had put up the 2016 report and compared that to the 2010 chart. Uh, so that's where that came from. All right, any more RSIS zoning uh, questions? And then there was one in the chat. Again, I think there's more of our model ordinance. Um, if the ordinance can require reduction in outflow off the site, are there common standards in use? Um, so our model ordinance has a on-site retention standard and some municipalities are looking at that. So you're actually keeping on-site through some means of infiltration, recharge, reuse um, a certain storm. Uh, we've recommended the 95th percentile storm. DEP is going to be proposing uh, sometime maybe in the first quarter of 2021 new stormwater regs uh, to address climate change, which will have a requirement for the water quality design storm or the inch and a quarter to be retained on site. Um, so that's that. All right. All right, seeing no other sort of RSIS questions, like I said, there is a bunch of um, model ordinance questions, which I'd be more than glad to answer. Um, but I wanna thank our panelists. I don't wanna take up more of your time uh, mm -hmm. than you need to. You can certainly uh, stay on if you would like. Um, to do, uh, do it and see if any other questions. But again, Mike and Lisa, thank you very much uh, for your help tonight. Uh, I'll mention again, this has been recorded. We're going to put the recording up. I will have the slides that Lisa, Mike and myself used up on our website and send out to all the participants probably in a couple of days. Uh, so, all right. Any last words, Mike or Lisa? Just thank, no, you thank you very much. You. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, our model ordinance. Um, you know, I'll go back. There was a question about the structural infiltration techniques versus non-structural. Uh, that has always been the age-old question and problem. DEP with the new model ordinance, the new regulations got away with, you know, got rid of the non-structural techniques uh, from a design standard that they put them into the uh, planning requirements, we think that you should keep them in uh, as part of your design standards. Uh, this might be an extreme example, but sort of the, the philosophy, the non-structural strategies, one of them is using natural topography, natural features, maintaining those, keeping the original grade, disconnecting impervious surfaces, there's nine of them. But if you took them out, 
you could quite literally clear your entire site of trees, regrade it, uh, and plop back in some rain gardens. And you've met this, the technical requirements of the green infrastructure rule, but kind of missed the point of it. Um, so we, we think if you use your non-structural low impact design standards, you're really better off. There was a question regarding the 250 square foot uh, trigger for impervious surface. Uh, so it's 250 square feet of impervious surface, not disturbance. Uh, when we developed that, that trigger, we took a look around the state. I believe, and I, I could be wrong, the lowest was 200 square feet. There might be one that's actually lower than that uh, as a trigger for stormwater management. Um, what I, I forgot to mention, there's probably about two dozen or so towns in New Jersey that have redefined major development and a, easily that many that have created some sort of minor development requirement. Uh, Sustainable Jersey also has a model ordinance that have you know, done that as well. So that's why this issue is so important. Um, so the question regarding science data that backs up the need to regulate minor development. So in many of our towns you know, that are already built out, you're only going to see additions or teardowns and redevelopment. You're not gonna see a lot of major developments. Some of the older boroughs really have no more green space. So unless you start chipping away at that increase of impervious surface, whether it's 250 square feet or some municipalities have a thousand square feet and you know somewhere in between, uh, Princeton has 400 square feet. Um, you're not gonna make the problem better, you're going to continue to make the problem worse. So we took 250 square feet as the trigger. Uh, Heightstown had that requirement as a voluntary uh, recommendations for green infrastructure. And we thought there was, a, you know, that was reasonable. Um, but again, like I said, municipalities, those two dozen or so towns have various whether it's 200 and like I said, I think there might be a town that's even less than that, all the way up to about a thousand square feet uh, as stormwater management. And you know, as part of the stormwater debate going on at DEP on some imp additional improvements, I think some people have you know, noted, well, all of the development that occurred before there was stormwater management is really a big problem. It's not the new development. And yes, we have to address older development through various techniques, whether it's redevelopment, whether it's stormwater utilities, whether it's other tools in the toolbox. Uh, but the stormwater management rules and everything we do is not reversing the trends. It's slowing down the degradation. It's slowing down the increase in uh, flooding. Uh, so the need to address it as many times in many places as possible uh, is important. Um, I don't believe there's the question regarding whether going forward ordinances need to upgrade, address the need to upgrade stormwater management to previously approved stormwater solutions for a property under a permit review. Um, so in green infrastructure, required green infrastructure or structural retention basin was the original solution. So under the um, municipal land use law, if a complete application is in uh, into the township before the town changes their ordinances. It's the old requirements that come in and are, are applicable, not the new ones. So you, if you have an application already in, already complete before your planning board and zoning board, the old rules apply. If it comes, if you do not have a complete application in, the new rules can apply. Um, Another question, many of the single family homes in our town exist on non-conforming size properties, smaller than the zone calls for. One of the challenges in adding single family homes to the ordinance is the expectation of green infrastructure on those sites may not fit. Uh, do we have standards? So we haven't come up with sort of a boilerplate, this is the size of the rain garden. There is a, a, a quite a bit of material out there that can help guide you from Rutgers, uh, co-op extension, in other words, uh, but in our model ordinance, we have created sort of a waiver ability for minor development only. 
not for major development because you can't waive those requirements without having a mitigation. Uh, but where you cannot do green infrastructure, it wouldn't make sense to do green infrastructure where you can't physically do stormwater management, giving a waiver to that minor development application so that um, they get that relief. We've recommended they pay a fee uh, for that so the municipality can then use the money to do improvements uh, to sort of pick up where that, improve, that, that stormwater management didn't occur. Uh, our recommendation is that it sort of is the same as what it would cost overall to do green infrastructure. Uh, the two gallons per 250 square feet seems low. Uh, we calculated that two gallons per square foot really is just shy of the two year storm, which is about 3.3 inches. So that is quite a bit of stormwater management. And the point to take is once you reach that trigger of 250 square feet, you treat all 250 square feet, not just the 251st, 252nd square foot. Um, question regarding financial burdens on property owners uh, and additional staffing requirements. So bluntly, yes, it will create some additional staffing requirements on the borough. Uh, if you do this, um, I think, again, we are all experiencing stormwater management. I think uh, the big storm that, that hit a couple of days ago uh, in the news, several roads in Princeton, Montgomery were closed because of that storm. And that wasn't even a two year storm. Uh, so that was less, I think it was 1.7 inches. I know regularly on my way to work, uh, one of the roads I take when it rains kind of hard or it's been raining for a couple of days tends to get closed. So that causes me to reroute. So it is causing us to do things now. And we're all paying for the flooding and water pollution indirectly. Also, when we crafted that two gallons per square foot, uh, we did it in a way that hopefully was very easy to implement, didn't require an engineer. And if you're doing an addition, you're doing a small development you're also doing landscaping around your property. Uh, very few people add or build a small home and do not do landscaping. So having that landscaping be your stormwater management techniques, uh, do double duty, it's sort of a change in thought process, but I, I think that really um, sort of does it um, and helps. And the cost is a bit, um, there's some studies out there that show it's about three to four dollars a square foot if you're doing it yourself, uh, maybe about ten dollars or so if you're having a contractor do it. And I think you get some economies of scale if your contractor who's building a foundation is doing your uh, digging for your rain garden or your other techniques. Um, uh, someone said there was more than two inches in the rain garden, uh, rain gauge in Berkeley Heights. Uh, so maybe in some areas it was a little higher, um, but two inches is still less than a two year storm of 3.3 inches. Uh, let's see. And again, yes, we are gonna send out a link to everyone who is registered about the webinar. Um, yeah, and uh, I guess one last question that just came in, the model, the DEP model ordinance mentions that the DEP rules apply as long as the project isn't preempted by RSIS. What other scenarios are there besides the one or two family dwelling cases? Um, that is the major one. I don't know, Mike, if you're still listening or Lisa, you wanna tackle that, but that is the, the biggest uh, bit. Um, uh, subdivisions of residential properties also would apply, uh, arguably, uh, but as Mike and, uh, talked about, really RSIS doesn't, we believe very strongly, uh, RSIS doesn't prohibit even with you know, a subdivision, a housing development, that stronger stormwater management. So it is now 7.38. Uh, again, I'll give it another second or two if there's are any other questions. Uh, but again, uh, Michael and Lisa, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. I appreciate it.
and to everyone. Um, I believe that was all the questions. Um, if people have additional questions, please reach out to me um, and I will try to address them. So thank you very much for attending tonight's webinar. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all on a webinar in the future. Jen, do you wanna say anything? You're on mute, so. <laughs> I unplugged my headphones, so I went on mute. Just wanna say thank you uh, for coordinating this this evening. Thanks to our speakers, for everyone who attended. Uh, and let you know that ANJAC is a resource as well. We work in partnership with the Watershed Institute on um, improving stormwater management throughout the state. So um, have a happy, healthy, and safe holiday season, and uh, we'll continue to work together to make New Jersey a better place. So thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.